Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Too Many Men podcast. My name is Allison Lucan, and I am joined by the principled, standard-raising, no-shit-taking. I admire her so much for all of those things. Sarah Sivian. Sarah, how are you today? I... If you're looking for a job, maybe don't use Twitter the way I use it. But you know what? I will never stop myself. It's just like comes with the package. So we'll get into that. But I'm, <laughs> I'm fine. How are we? <laughs> well, I'm better now that I'm with you. And of course, also with the woman who makes this podcast truly what it is, the shit talking, all knowing, the athletics, Shana Goldman. Shana, say hi. Hi. That was my favorite intro yet. Shit talking, all knowing. I should get a business <laughs> card that says that. We'll get right on that. Put that in the in the store. Too many men merch.com. Buy your own business card. <laughs> Buy my business card. You have to pay to have mine. To Buy Shana's <laughs> business card. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get omnipresent. Right in. Um, ooh, so many hyphenations. <laughs> All right. Let's go. So Jean-Luc Grandpierre, who has two names, his first and last are both hyphenated. His nickname is the hyphenator. <laughs> that's that's amazing he's great that's a good I'm one i know he's so it's good. creative versus like just everyone adding an er to the end i know so logan morrison got called up by the seattle kraken and his nickname is lomo i like that it's so cute not that i should say he's cute but like you know what i'm saying it's, it's a good no, nickname name... it's not a er or a y e. at the end yeah well like what logie that, see that's bad <laughs> that's a bit loger that's, bad. <laughs> that's terrible all right, and let's get into it. Sarah, what time is it? It's time for the original sound. Bit of news. A bit of news, my friends. Yes, here we are. Let's get into all the headlines that we want to talk about going on around the league. And there's nothing better to start with than the women's hockey team at the Ohio State University. Notice I don't emphasize the the because that's fucking dumb. It's Ohio <laughs> State University people. But what's not dumb is Nadine Muserol and her team for the second time in three years, they bring home the national championship, the first ever for this team at this university, these two championships. And in a wonderful little bit of, I love the tweet that the team put out. They put out the UNO you know reverse card. Last year, Ohio State loses to Wisconsin in the championship game 1-0. This year, they win 1-0 off of a goal by the legendary Joy Dunn, Rookie of the Year in college women's hockey. Shayna, I know you were watching this game. <clears throat> Tell us why Ohio State is so wonderful. For all of the reasons. I mean, first of all, you look at Wisconsin, what a powerhouse they are. You have Caroline Harvey, you have Lacey Eden, you have Layla Edwards. To go up against that team, I think is super intimidating. I think seven players are going to USA camp for Worlds. So that kind of tells you just what they were going up against. But I love the way Ohio State plays. First of all, we love we love Jincy, we love Joy, we love all the Dunn sisters. We want to see them thrive. But Nadine Muserol is such a cool coach. Like, I don't, I see her behind the bench and I'm like, that to me is like the, she is everything and more. I want to see her get shots pet. Like I want her to stay Ohio State forever because she's amazing. But like, I want to see her get big opportunities from here because I love the style of play. They are hard to play against. They are aggressive, you know, defensively. And while shorthanded, like she has a power kill. I, it just, everything, I know you wrote an amazing profile on her. But I, I think that they are so fun to watch. And the whole tournament was exciting. But that final, it gave you drama. It gave you everything you could have wanted from it. Tremendous goaltending as well, particularly even in the semifinal. Clarkson's goaltender is, my goodness gracious, outstanding. Sarah, what were your takeaways? How much of the game were you able to take in with your schedule? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, with my busy schedule. But well, you um, are busy. You're doing I know. I, I am. Um, I just continue to love Coach Nadine. I love her. I think she's electric and clearly a winner. I love, I want them to have the best of the best in terms of facilities and everything. And uh, yeah, I would love to see that as the next step. They've proved more than capable of winning and being a powerhouse and love to see it. Absolutely. We are team hashtag build them a rank because for literally now, I was trying to count the other day, seven, eight years, Ohio State has been saying we're looking into it. it I'm, I'm like, over this. 
yeah. oh, I'm over this. You have enough money to build a second waterfall in the fucking football team's locker room. <laughs> build the women with the championships a damn rank that's not 100 years old. All right, let's move on. So this is a little just an update in what has been going on in the ongoing Kyle Beach um, addendum situation with the Chicago Blackhawks, where a second John Doe um, did come out and alleged that he was sexually assaulted by the former team video coach Brad Aldrich. Uh, the Chicago Blackhawks asked for that to be dismissed, and this was announced two days ago, Monday. A U.S. federal court judge has denied the request to have the case dismissed, so it does look like this second case um, slash investigation will move forward. I think that's important. I think it's very, very necessary that we understand all the implications and acts that Aldrich did and that teams and people be held accountable so that these things don't happen in the future. Sarah, what are your takeaways from the court's decision? One of a few good ones since we don't get many from high-end courts in the U.S. anymore. I know, I know. It's just, it's telling the way the Blackhawks try to handle this, where they're trying to get it thrown out. And I mean, I guess you fight for whatever if you're on that side. But the fact that this doesn't just go away because Connor Bedard's here, you know what I mean? Like, this is an ongoing, it's not people, maybe authors, maybe fans try to write this story as if it's over or like it's a game and the game's ended and now it's a different era of Blackhawks. And it's just not this, this is people's lives. And yeah, I'm glad to see the court handling it. And it just is an ongoing legal issue in people's lives. So I, I think you can't just look at the Blackhawks now and say like, it's all over. Like, I think we have to keep paying attention to this. A hundred percent. And, you know, again, we've on this show, and I believe rightly, praised the Blackhawks for the things like how they handled the Corey Perry situation. So to your point, Sarah, there can be growth, but there can't be growth without addressing mistakes of the past. Shana, when you heard this news, what were your thoughts? Yeah, it's just nice to see situations keep progressing. I feel like sometimes it feels like the media gets really hyped about something. And like this one, I think there was way more involvement than we usually see. But then it obviously died down and you don't want people to forget like the situation isn't over yet just because times have changed. This is past. It's not being brought up every single day. Um, and obviously it's not going to be at this point, but it's still a situation to follow. You still want to learn from it because hockey is still completely and totally fucked. And there are problems like this at all levels all over the place. So you don't want to see it happen again. So hopefully um, people keep paying attention, keep learning from the situation. And yeah, we don't forget it just because it's a different era of Blackhawks hockey. They continue, they can have to continue learning from it to be better. And obviously it's different people now running the show and it's nice to see how they have progressed and how they're handling things. And hopefully they keep going from there. So this never happens again. Could not agree more. Well, on the flip side, <laughs> my goodness gracious, stories that the media seems to want to pay an overly large amount of attention to um, in what I honestly was like, well, this should just be a good story. A uh, friend of the pod, Zach Hyman, who we love, um, has scored 50 plus goals. He's actually now at 51 um, for the first time in his career, 31 years old, had a tenure with the Leafs, was not re-signed there, and then signs with Edmonton where he had had previously his other two high goal totals being 36 last year and 27 the year before that. But I was just happy for the guy. This is a guy who's had a great year, multiple hat tricks, stands up for things, isn't afraid to speak out, just plays in a great fun way, goes to hard areas. And then there was the discourse. So before we get to the discourse, Shayna, from a pure hockey sense, Talk about how meaningful it is for Zach Hyman to achieve this goal. I would have loved for him to do it against Toronto. He only got one of the two he needed. But how meaningful is this for hockey and for Zach Hyman? And what does it say about the player in and of the sport itself? It's huge. First of all, scoring's on the rise, and that's more exciting for everybody. And we're also focused in on Austin Matthews and Sam Reinhart in the scoring race. That It was nice to see Zach Hyman just pull even with Reinhart. They've been going back and forth for 50 and 51. It's good for the game. It's also exciting for the game when it's someone we don't expect. We expect Pashnak to be up there. We expect Matthews. We expect McDavid and Leandre Seidel. We don't always expect Zach Hyman. 
And for him, I think this is really cool because it's someone that, yes, he benefits from playing with top players, but you look at it, you have to keep up with top players and you have to compliment them. Those are two totally different things than just being there. Anybody can just be in that situation. Look, Vander Kane was, and now he's on the third line flailing and getting healthy scratch. Like mm -hmm. you, you don't just thrive because you're with Connor McDavid. You have to put in the work there too. And I think we've seen that from him. If we look back to 2013, um, for finishing talent, he, he continues to be one of the best with backhands above expected. And he led the league, I think for 2023 and 2022, but in 2022, he had, I think it was 14 wrist shots below expected. He couldn't convert on his chances. So the fact that now he's a 50 goal scorer, it kind of shows he must've put in some sort of work to adjust what he was, what he wasn't doing right before because he was in the right areas, but he wasn't converting. So I think it makes it all the more impressive when you put that context into it of his past seasons. Yeah, I, I was honestly really happy for him. And there was originally the discourse, which I already mentioned, which is, you know, oh, it's another, you know, F you to the Leafs. It's another player. Why didn't he do this when they were when he was here? And the Leafs fans were all up in arms about this. And then there was the discourse that Shana has discussed about the fact that, oh, it's just because he plays with McDavid, which I'm honestly quite sick of, because if you watch this guy play, he does work hard at his game. And then the discourse took a weird turn where people were saying he didn't deserve the accolades. He's even if he's 31 years old, there was too much privilege given. And, and I honestly, there was way too much hockey on yesterday, so I couldn't fully follow the whole thing. And we'll get to that later. I wish but, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Sarah, what do, what do you want to share? And, and what do you want to share? I want to give you the stage, too. But also, more importantly, like, what should we be taking away from Zach Hyman's accomplishments from a narrative perspective? Whatever the fuck we want, I guess. Like, I think, and I got the inside scoop from Bestie Leon. I asked him what it's like to watch. I love this season Hyman's having. I feel like the way he's scoring, it's a combination of skill. And like, you have to be like breaking news. You have to be good to play next to Connor McDavid. It's not as easy as you'd think, right? Like, it's not like you got to have the hockey sense that he has. And Leon was like, he's such Leon. a smart player. Leon Dreisaitl, <laughs> like, he's such a smart player. But the discourse happened when, oh God, I didn't think I even watched the video from Andrew. Honestly, he, <laughs> everyone was just, he said that Zach Kaiman is, his career was brought on privilege and people took that as calling out a Jew, a openly proud, hell yeah, Jew for, having this privilege that all other hockey players have. And I mean, I, I, I think I, that's valid, but in the state we're in right now with the war, it just got to complete, like everybody's grifting, everybody's picking a side. Like it's, it brings out the worst people that are using that as like a way to bully people that may not have met, meant that, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I don't know. I should have shut my mouth sometimes because it's just like, I get, I'm Jewish and I believe like everybody should be openly proud and Jewish. And I think we should look at the stereotypes that say like Jewish people are rich. Why, why is that bad? That's bad because it's some type, it's like how Kanye says it's some type of cult. Like that's a really bad, harmful stereotype. And it's just the way the discourse goes online. Sometimes it's like people have been waiting for somebody to maybe slip up and say something stupid. And it was something extremely stupid. No matter who he called out for this, it was like the stupidest thing in the world. Like he deserves to have 50 goals. Like, well, and also like respectfully to your point, Sarah, like show me the hockey player whose family wasn't yeah. well off with the resources to buy 18,000 sticks and 400 skates yeah. and put, replace windows when the puck goes through because the kid's shooting out in his driveway. Like, unfortunately, that is a barrier to the sport is that a lot of these yeah. players came from well-off families because that is what the sport requires right now. Yeah. It was random to go after him. So like, he's just minding his business. Yeah. Everybody's like loving his story. And then it's like Andrew. Asked, no, don't man. enjoy this. Don't enjoy <laughs> yeah. his story. Like he's literally like... it's crazy too, because like you think about it, how many stories do we hear about the players who don't have that? Like the Panarins of the world, right? There was the yeah. Portsline profile on that. He's those, Jewish. Those are just the, 
the few offs versus what you need to play. It's one of the most expensive sports. And like, to be let's clear, be realistic. To be clear, we are not saying that makes that okay. This sport yeah. needs to be more accessible. One million thousand percent. It's there just was the a reality way, right now. Yeah. There was a way yeah. to go about that discussion. And now this sets us back because now you have Obi Cohen, who is I'm my number one op, I think. <laughs> he just the way he's so nasty and goes after yeah. people. I feel sometimes like I need to be Robin Hood and I really should just shut my mouth, but I like have to go after him. I'm like, you're being weird. No, let's call this. I think I can solve the world's problems in one day or something. And it just comes out wrong sometimes, but like I, he's been saying some really vitriolic stuff online recently. And I'm like, why does he get away with that? But that's, I that's don't. That's being nice. Yeah. That's on, I didn't see that tweet until you quote tweeted it. I should have, <laughs> you know, and that's the problem. I should not be doing that. But no, what? no, no. It's because I keep muting people. Yeah. I've that's... been trying to get one slice of rice of peace. <laughs> and this, I'm, I'm muting people because yeah. of shit like this. Yeah, like it shouldn't it be to. all the time. Like I get it. Everybody has opinion. It's not like everyone wants to see my fucking opinion all the time. Right. I oh, but they do. So oh, but they, oh, but they I, do. I would they love do. to see your opinion though. <laughs> Wow, this see, this is what I need for my confidence. I'm gonna go off on a tear tonight during the two <laughs> games on the schedule. But like, sometimes people just have to like insert themselves into this conversation and have such yeah. ass backwards takes. And it's like, why are we going here? Why are we having this it gives conversation? Them, it's because it was an in to give them an excuse to go yeah. there. And that's what gets me like so riled up because I think there is a time and a place for this discussion, but it's not, oh, you can't speak up or you're, anti-Semitic. I'm like, I am like, I'm like, it's immediately calling somebody out. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's a really vol volatile time in the world right now. And I always regret speaking about it online because I, it does affect me as somebody who like really is, has a nuanced, I think a nuanced opinion on it and like an, a unique opinion on it. I just mm -hmm. feel like it does like the personal attacks come. I'm getting emails, but I'm getting positive emails that are like, okay, like thanks for sticking up for some Jewish people. I don't know. Like, I just what am I like here? Like, I just don't need to be tweeting this. The Jewish hero think. we never knew we need. Yeah. See, <laughs> yeah. last year when <laughs> I really even had a rant, but <laughs> when I went on my rant about from Saturday Night Live, the Hanukkah guy. Remember? Oh my god, what was his name? Hanukkah, Hanukkah. Harry. Hanukkah Harry, yes. Yeah. You remember <laughs> last year's rant about how I need one dreidel on the ice? Yes. yes. I didn't get it from a player, but I'm getting it. <laughs> from Sarah from Simeon. Me too. Yeah, Sarah, my Jewish hero. <laughs> we're the Jewish duo. No one knew they needed in the fucking NHL. Yeah, we're as Jew in the world, though, depending on who you ask. Uh, but I've never I so fast gotten, like, doxing immediately. Like, I don't... That's this type of issue. And on a serious yeah, note, it's yeah. like, I... It's hard because I don't want to speak up because like, oh, it's really tough. And people have really solid opinions on it that, I mean, it's probably not great for any like potential employer. So I'll wait a week until I continue my job search probably. But like, it does concern me the amount people try to shut you down from yeah. saying, I don't mm -hmm. think like there should be a war. I feel like it's so militant, like the responses and they're just like instant and- I'm finding where you live. It's like, yeah, I didn't yeah. say anything crazy. I think if we can't have a discussion, what can we have? Yeah. And it's hard on Twitter too. Like, I, I feel like that makes it that much worse. Like you have 240 characters to express your opinion without yeah. making it 10 tweet threads. And even if you have a tweet thread explaining your thoughts, someone will pick the one and be like, here it is. It's wrong. Or you can't put like nuance in it or try to like you do anything. And people are so quick to jump in with this. It's like 10 times worse. And it feels like the conversation, like the way it's been in hockey is also so weird on top of it. Like it yeah. has been, and like Colby Cohen has, has been. been part of the reason why. And like they're promoting when that shit goes on Fox News and then it's just yeah. like- no, exactly. Nobody calls him out. So of course, here I come with my annoying ass, like needing to call him we out. Get he to urge to call him out. Cape, blue yeah. cape with little menorahs and dreidels <laughs> on it. <laughs> oh my, my new project yeah, is just me. about to drop when I get a new machine. Like this is it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to some other points-based news. And <laughs> full credit to Shana for this one, because I literally had to confirm what this was about in the show notes. But it was a big night for carbs, you guys. Pasta and bread <laughs> both hit 100 <laughs> points. Fantastic, Shana. I love it so much. 
I, um, I can't take honestly I can't take credit for it I tweeted it because they were within minutes of each I literally like at a break looked at the saw posture posture hit it and immediately someone said like oh great night for carbs and I was like fuck I wish I got that one like I wish that good. came to me it's very good it's very good well let's let's give yeah, these players <laughs> let's give these players their flowers you know it's funny to me I was able to cover Artemi Panarin for a few years and I had a great respect for his game and the past couple of years, it's kind of the narrative has been kind of that it's been a down year or he hasn't been playing up to his full potential. So it's really cool to see him now kind of get back in the spotlight. He's always flown under the radar relative to what I think he is as a player, in my opinion. And then I would say the same for yeah. Pasternak, right? Like, again, just a supremely talented player that we're almost taking for granted because he is so good consistently. Each of mm -hmm. these players plays on a team in each of your backyard. So I'll have you talk about each of them respectively. Shayna. Give us some joy for our Temi Panarin hitting 100 points. It's so exciting for him. He's such an amazing player. I I love getting to watch him play. I He was fun in Chicago. It was a blast in Columbus. And to see now it, in New York, like, he's someone that I think you see brings a lot of energy when he's on the ice. There's little details that he's so shifty and he's so smart that it, it's always fun to watch him. And now, you know, we know him to be this elite player in transition and an elite playmaker. And it's always been interesting how since he's been with the Rangers, they've kind of figured out where to put him on a line. And a lot of the time, the right wing has just been someone that's like, well, that's defensive support, but not someone who can necessarily keep up and complement a top player because that who knew is hard to do. And you're seeing, I think, a big difference because you have Alexi Lafreniere on that right wing who's really picked up his um, passing game. And if you look at uh, all three zones tracking, like they have a nice visual of high danger passes and high danger and shots off high danger passes. And the two of them, Lafreniere and Panarin are so far off together in one of the like most favorable spots because they're both setting each other up with really like nice passes to, to make their shots all the more dangerous. And obviously they're both benefiting from it. And we're seeing him pick up his shooting as a result with Trocek just being like a nice utility player in between them. And it's made for one of the better combinations he's had in New York. And I think you're seeing that in the results. He's still doing everything that we know he can do. He can hold possession and, and you know, fight everyone off pucks and hold the puck on a stick better than most. But now he's more willing to shoot because he has someone setting him up. So really great season for him all around. Um, and now everyone's going to, you know, start whining about him in the playoffs and shit like that as if he hasn't been good in the playoffs before. But that's another conversation. Sarah, give us some joy and love for Pasternak, our pasta man. First of all, yeah, pa the pasta man, the bread, the pastellini. That's what they call his kid. How cute is that? Pastellini. First of all, Trocek, nice utility player, is literally like that's the perfect prototype way to describe him. That just like really satisfied me. But um, and he's having a great year. Everyone was mean to him last year. They didn't like him last year in New York at all. A lot of people they were like bored with him because it's not flashy. But it's like no, it's not. Until the playoffs, he talks more shit than anybody, and he will turn it on, but sometimes that will end up in a penalty. But, oh, I digress. Um, let's turn into the Trotech show. Um, Pasternak, yeah, it's such an interesting predicament. I was ranting about this. What wasn't I ranting about yesterday? Um, I feel like, like Allison said, him and Panarin don't get enough credit for, like, these seasons and these 100 points that they're putting up. And it's funny because... Somebody responded, I'm like, I don't think Pasternak gets nearly enough credit, whatever. And somebody responded, it's because people love like, oh, a hard-nosed game, like a hard fought, whatever. And it's like, I think it's interesting that Panarin and Pasternak both grew up poor, but they have really sharp skill sets. You know what I mean? So it's like, they have a rags to riches coming up story. Like, I think, I don't know, like the hard work, they've worked harder than anybody. But anyway, it's just interesting, right? I think... Pasternak is very underrated in Boston, but maybe adequately rated in the rest of the mm, world. But there's like just that. this notion here. People think he's been injured too much. I don't even know what it is. He's a point per Why? game in his Why entire do career. Say he's injured too much. I don't like, get that. sorry. Like that he, he wants to be. Like, that's he's, a like, choice. Putting these... like, I choose yeah. to be injured. What are we doing? The but discourse also, like, is insane. He, missed, he hasn't missed chunks at it. Like, at a clip like I don't get that it's not like he's someone that you know is only gonna play 60 games a year I feel like people don't understand truly what he's brought to the team until he he goes because people have thought 
oh, it's just Bergeron. Oh, it's just Marchand. Oh, it's Chara. Like, right. It's Kregi. Like now that he's, they're gone and he's still cooking. Like the pasta is boiling at speeds that nobody Did can. Did you call him Kregi? Yeah. Is, is it that David Kregi? Kregi. Yeah, crazy. I can never do this. This is a bad one too. He roasts me too. He is one that like, what did I say to him? I asked him a question like once and he was it, like, of course, you guys think you fucking know everything. I was like, oh my God. I like that. that you play off when you say the names wrong. Like the confidence behind it, it gives us, this, like we yeah. have to take pause and go. I'm gaslighting you. <laughs> But All with right, the Boston, but... it's hard around here with the Boston accent with Andy it's Brickley. It's crazy, is it not? It's crazy, yeah. but yeah. he could like David Crazy, <laughs> like he like he announces it in a different way. Don't blame me. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, cost is good. Congratulations. Good fashionable. Congratulations to our all carb squad. We <laughs> acknowledge their efforts. Um, I put this in the notes because I just literally had this random thought post deadline. Like, do we realize we've just now never addressed the question of what ended up happening to Phil Kessel? Like he went and he was practicing with Abbotsford. Everyone assumed the Canucks were going to sign him. And now here we are post trade deadline and Phil Kessel has left the building. Do we know what's going on? I mean, obviously he's not going to play this year because he can't play in the playoffs since he's not on an NHL roster. But do we know what this, is Phil Kessel done? Thoughts? Time to start another rumor about him. Maybe he's <laughs> going to get some hot dogs in oh Vancouver. They got good sushi there. That's true. But we don't know. Do I have, have no idea. Nobody, there's no reports or anything out of what happened with that. It just, like, it was a weird one. Because it, like, okay, would it help to have an extra scoring threat if someone in your top six gets hurt? Sure. But if he's not playing in the top six, which, what's he going to do if everyone's no, healthy? No, not in Vancouver, the healthy scratch no. in Vegas. Yeah. He's just not someone that would have made sense. I feel like in their bottom six at all. So it was like, do you put yeah. the cap space there when you need it for yeah. like, they're so up against it. It was like, I get it. He could go with Rick Tockett who has maximized his game better than anyone, but it's like, it it could like, if they had extra money, I feel like it would be one thing, but yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk to one more thing that Shana has alluded to and it's driving me batshit crazy. And we have talked forever about not having staggered start times but now the league has decided to take us up on our offer to challenge us and fuck us over one more time. And that is the distribution of games by day. I would like to recount the past couple days. Monday, two games. Yesterday, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 games. If you have to work to cover one of those games, it literally becomes impossible to cover even half of those games on the same day. Today, two games both within a half hour start time of each other. So there's not even an East game and a West game. What the hell is going on now? And why can we not get some even distribution, particularly when we should, because there are so many great narratives. Shana, this is your passion. This is your cross to bear. <laughs> the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. You know what? She's it's ready. Funny okay. It's funny. Cause last night I tweeted about this because I went to the, I went to a Which game. I couldn't see night. because there were too many games going on. Exactly. Um, I went to a game last night, which I would not have done if I didn't get handed tickets, honestly, because I knew I was going to be overwhelmed afterwards, right? Like I am at intermission on my phone, watching Leafs Devils on the train home. I'm watching the Predators come back. Um, not and watching a breakdown home, of a too many men penalty power play goal for the Kraken. Mm, interesting. I know. I really miss it. I need a clip of that, please. Okay. Um, I get home and I'm like, oh, I'll watch a recap. And it's live coverage of the shark stars which is the one game that really wasn't on my fucking radar I love the stars love watching them all the time not against the sharks when i'm like overwhelmed at what i've missed i'm checking natural statric i'm waiting for sportsnet to put up their condensed replays i'm so overwhelmed because i'm gonna miss one game and me to do my job and i know not everyone has this problem if you cover one team you can stay like your tunnel vision for that team and that's okay but it helps to have perspective and it's impossible to have it Tonight, there's two games. Friday, there's one game. I get it for Easter Sunday completely, right? But it's overwhelming. These games are so important. 
Red Wings uh, Capitals is a huge game. If that got the national spotlight on Wednesday and they had more of a flex schedule, like that would be amazing, right? Because those are key games to watch. Boston, Florida is a big one to go head to head with. Then you have Winnipeg, Edmonton. Next week's schedule, which is nice, is a little more balanced. You have eight games, five games, nine games, which is all I'm asking for. I don't need double digit games. And that's why everyone made such a big deal of that frozen frenzy. Like, look, there's 14 games at once and it's all staggered. There's 14 games at once all the fucking time. It's not impressive. Mm -hmm. Even if, you know, the NHL says we want Wednesday night to stand out. That's our night. That's fine. But load up your Friday nights and load up your Sundays the second football season ends. Um, The last week of the season is going to be the same problem. It's going to be 13 games one night, two games the next. When these are important playoff games. And even if you're saying, well, the casual fan doesn't care, the last two weeks of the season, they probably do. I'm sitting in the stands last night hearing everyone around me talk about the playoff race and the Red Wings game and checking the score for the Caps and wanting to know what's going on with the Panthers and the Hurricanes. Like, that shit matters. So don't stack up every Eastern Conference game at the same time. It's just ridiculous. And I know people are quick to mention, like, well, a lot goes into schedule making, you know, the arena availability and what's overlapping in the area. I'm not a fucking idiot. Actually, I wanted that job very badly. I have a goddamn master's degree in sports business. I know all about event management. Um, I get that. You have to handle that. That's great and wonderful. But even still, if you redo it and go through the schedule, it still doesn't follow the pattern. They have a, they want this. And it's just bad for the fucking game. Sarah, that's what I wanted you to comment on, too, is like, yes, every fan is probably going to start with an interest in their local team and follow that team the most of all. But are we missing opportunities to grow the game? Because a lot of fans at different levels of following the NHL are not able to catch up on the bigger narratives that are going to endear you to this sport as a whole. Yeah, it's like when Shana makes her concession that, Maybe the casual fan doesn't care. And then, of course, she says, yes, they do end up. They don't have a chance to care. They don't know what they could be caring about. And then I obviously, what is it? My second year covering the whole league. This is the biggest challenge that I didn't even, I guess I wasn't thinking about. Like, of course, I have so much more respect for national writers. Now that I think about, like, maybe they get one thing wrong. They can't. First of all, you can't watch every single game, even if they were spread out. Second of all, it really is like 14 games at once. So I get, I give them a little more lenience. I mean, there's not really an excuse if you're in that title, but at the same time, they make it impossible. And then not to mention, if I'm trying to watch the games at the bar, that's not happening. Like it, they'll either have Nesson, so it's just the Bruins every single time, or they'll have like basketball on. Like it's just... They can't play every single game at once. They need to invent that bar. I go to that hockey bar. I guess they have one in New York City called the Canuck. Shout out Julie Stewart Bings who goes there. But any anyway, I think it's still overwhelming though. Yeah, it's well, overwhelming. Someone, keep in mind, watches multiple and, screens at once always. There's and, like you have to balance your brain doing yeah. it and try to. There's still times I'll have multiple games at once, and that game ends, and I'm going back and rewatching and noting what I need to go back because I missed. Well, at the very the- least. Else and go. The, the worst the worst thing too is like unfortunately in the u.s at least we don't have a good recap show the only thing we have is nhl network with which if you have it is a league sanctioned recap so you're not necessarily getting all the actual things mm-hmm. that happen in the game literally so then you have to literally. go onto twitter and see like oh someone's talking about this hit or someone's talking about this fight and then you have to Google that and hope that someone clipped it or put it on Twitter or that it's in a, you know, in a blog article somewhere so that you can actually see the full narrative of the game because those things do matter versus just here's the goals and here's what happened. Yeah. I've had to be honest sometimes when I'm going to like during the trade deadline week, I was at three Bruins games and then I had to write like one thing about the whole league i was like i need a little more time to do this because i yeah. couldn't possibly have watched all the games at 100%. once and i'm not gonna lie to the audience about it but it really is like it's a daily challenge in my life i'll, I'll, I'll even 100%. try to go to the bar to be like maybe i'll watch a few at once and that never happens and i'm just drinking and it's like i'm not even watching the game because it's well, at we're, all we're people who want to we are people who want to be up yeah. on it. like if you are tr- if you are casually trying to just, you just be like screw it just show me the scores and this is when seriously, the West Coast bias, the East Coast bias becomes a real thing because you wake up mm-hmm. and all you have time to do or maybe interest to do is you look at the scores and the scores don't always tell the story yeah. of every game and it just skews perception of so many different things. 
I had to look myself yeah. in the eye and be like, girl, you have not watched one St. Louis Blues game all season 100%. and you need to change that. I've watched like five recently and I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm not going to keep shitting on them right. <laughs> like, if I haven't seen a game. Yeah. So it's, I need to know I'm what's going on. And I think the East is so much harder to keep up with because you see those seven o'clock. I love, you know, like 930 starts and forward because I'm like, good, at least there's only two or three games on at once. Except for when the Western Conference teams come east, well, then I was I gonna say that's not true. Out. Yeah, yeah. Like when the West stays in the West, and you have like those home games, it's like thank goodness because you can kind of like breathe and go through them. And but you it's say not... that I can't. I have the same problem you have. Well, in the east. exactly. There's your yeah. bias, Shayna Goldman. I see you. <laughs> well, also like if you're working a game too, like if you're not working a game, and there's a ten and a ten thirty on versus seven sevens it's like okay like there are some nights i feel like the west can be easier to follow the well not the central but like the pacific can be easier to follow but it just it shouldn't be this hard and then like i know some people get upset when you're like well you should stagger start times like no i'm not even going there yet like would i like a 7 15 or 7 30 start once in a while absolutely on a weekday i understand why games don't start later. Like the Islanders are 7.30 because it works out with the train schedule and it's more convenient that way, but that's the minority of it. And you don't want a 7.30 start if you want to bring your kids. But on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, there's no fucking reason for it. And God forbid you decide to have a life on a Saturday night, Honestly. right? You can't. God forbid. I, I know, no, literally, I know Fridays God forbid. are my opening. Honestly. Yeah, poor boyfriend. I'm like, can you make one game? Can you make a next game? I know, honestly. <laughs> like, 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 I'm from Texas. <laughs> we have a game every other day this month. It's a crazy ass schedule month. And then like when it's off days, Stephen will be like, can we do something? I'm like, no, I have to watch. I need to watch like 18 yep. games that I didn't even catch up from yesterday either. Literally. Well, yeah. let's move on. And then on. if you're behind it, it snowballs. Let's move on to the actual hockey. So the stuff that we <laughs> yeah. actually we can talk about hockey that, that we could so, take yeah. 1% yeah. in of. So on to the hockey that we need to talk about. Uh, Shana, you mentioned this one. This one is an interesting one that, guess what, shocker, I didn't get to see because I was working, but of the 806 games yesterday, truly a pivotal match. And we're going to go through these kind of quick here, but Washington and Detroit, it was a must win for Detroit, who is chasing Washington, the team that no one expected, who's currently in a wild card spot. Detroit was behind them. Washington comes back with the OT win. So now... Washington remains in the second wild card spot. Detroit two points back. Washington has a game in hand. Sarah, what do you make of this game specifically? This is a situation the Kraken went reeling after they lost a similar game to Vegas a couple weeks ago, and it ended up kind of pushing them out of playoff contention because they couldn't get their feet back under them. What do you make of the Red Wings after this loss? God. I guess they're showing us who they really are. It's been such a roller coaster all season. And it's like the way you always go back to, I think their confidence got really lost once Larkin got out of the lineup and they started playing poorly. They really are like really riding on his back. You look at the lack of five on five goals from Alex to Um, I think that's been pretty damning. I've loved, I love him as a player, but I mean, he's been cooking on the power play, but he's needed to do a little bit more. They haven't had, I don't know. I love kind of not an entire upheaval of a team, right? When you're talking about the Ezra plan, but you wonder if, I mean, like Patrick Kane is just not cutting it for me in terms of star power for a playoff run. You know what I mean? Like you look at who could they go out and get. I like that they didn't necessarily do anything at the deadline, but I think it's an acknowledgement that they just aren't there yet. They might still sneak into the first round, but it's getting like slimmer and slimmer if they do. I could see them maybe going on a Cinderella run because it's like, well, fuck it, we're here. But they don't really have the power to like be a confident team in this like slate of other teams. It's going to be such a tough competition. Yeah, they say we keep we keep rooting for you, Detroit, but you keep yeah. falling just a little bit short. Shayna, a team that isn't falling short in their post U two era is Nashville. This is a game I know you were able to watch, and this is another wild one. Nashville is now at a point streak of 18 games. They came back from being down 4-1 to Vegas to win that game. They are ahead of Vegas in the wild card spot. Both teams now with the same number of games played, and Nashville has four points on Vegas in a Western Conference where seeding is going to be huge in terms of matchups because this is going to be some big boy teams going up against each other 
in the postseason. What do we make of Nashville? I know we talked about them last week, but what do we make of them now? You know, it's interesting. Like Saturday was Predators Red Wings going up against each other in like a hell of a game. And these were two teams at the same time who saw their playoff odds just surge and one ran with it and one kind of fell apart. The Predators have been so good this year and it's not just one thing that's working for them. Like UC Soros had some serious, serious struggles in January and you see he's found his footing. Kevin Lankinen has been excellent as their backup. So they're now they're getting that stable goaltending. But the biggest thing is their five on five play. Like since that game where they completely ate shit to Dallas, they are top three in expected goal generation and top three in expected goal suppression. Like they are doing everything each and every night. And like, this was no last night's game was another example of that. Like I like the resilience they're showing they're winning games in different ways. They're not necessarily just dominating. The power play is pretty solid. Ryan O'Reilly has been so good. I mean, could you imagine you're the Maple Leafs with Max Domi potentially as your three C or winger? Cause he doesn't play well down the middle and Ryan O'Reilly's popping off in Nashville because it always links back to the Leafs. Philip Forsberg's playing great hockey, but Roman Yossi is absolutely crushing it to me. Like, MVP worthy play, Norris worthy play. So you just see it all coming together for them right now. Sarah, that another- Roman Yossi overtime goal last night. I mean, it's just killer. I love when the good players are the good players, you know? Exactly. You want to see the star- stars, stars. It's yes. exciting. Stars are starring. Well, Sarah, speaking of point streaks and impressive players, Nathan McKinnon continues to just be a force. His team, Colorado, now 9-1-0 and in their last 10. They sit at second in the Central, two points behind Dallas with a game in hand. Colorado just has been doing it all season long. It's impressive how they, this is a team that has massaged their roster and gotten results. What do you make of bestie Nathan McKinnon and the Colorado Avalanche? Gunna's free. I mean, he's been waiting for this. He's Gunna's been making new music and Nathan's been listening and this is exactly what's happening in all seriousness. I mean, he's having the best year of his life. And when he is, I mean, I don't know, off the ice, the best year of his career, (laughs) but like when he's on, there's nobody more electric to watch. And then you look at, I was doing some research for the heart race. Like I'm always trying to keep up on that. And just like his attention to off ice, training his dad was really into training I guess growing up and just learning about he's kind of Rod Brindamore-esque with the way that like Rod Brindamore with more skill no offense Roddy but just loving the day-to-day it makes sense that he's peaking later like in let like it's his peak hasn't ended because he's taking care of himself so well he has that competitive edge and of course the team around him I mean Scott Walker at the deadline good idea um you've seen the flyers kind of been reeling from the absence of him and the maneuvers again with casey middlestat um i love it even when a player like byram is gone and he's cooking over in buffalo land whatever the fuck is going on over there um they didn't necessarily they identified a more urgent need for themselves and i think that's just like what you need to do at the deadline i'm starting to think like more tweaks that are so improving your I mean, revolutionary idea here, but not just getting maybe the best guy, but willing to give something up to improve your needs. I don't know. I just, Jared Bednar looks absolutely fucking fire on the bench every single day with his suits and his hair. Growing the hair I, He's out. like growing kind of a like gray mullet. Yeah. I'm so here for it. And I don't know, good for them. That's my review of the Colorado <laughs> Avalanche. Thanks for coming back to my channel. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Well, there is a team that has actually done enough, as impressive as the teams we've talked about are, that has done enough to be the first to clinch an actual playoff spot, and that is the New York Rangers. They get it done uh, last night. Boston can tonight with one point, Um, but let's talk about the Rangers. We already talked about Panarin, but Shayna, it does seem to be a just reward that the Rangers are for sure 100% locked and loaded for games past number 82. Yeah, and it's interesting. It comes last night, like a night where they're missing three of their regular defenders or without Lindgren, Truba, and Gustafson. And like, you can see that third pair was struggling <laughs> last night. And it was such an exciting game against the Flyers too. Like anytime 
the Rangers gave up like an odd man rush. The Flyers were converting on their chances and it was really back and forth. But it, I, I like to like they're winning games in different ways. You're seeing they look a lot more complete and they're doing something different under Peter Lavula. You can see they're tweaking lines when they don't need to. Like some coaches like we can't change the lines after wins. But you can see like they have 13 forwards. They want to be ready for the playoffs and they keep making little line adjustments to pretty much every line that's not Panarin's just to see what works to keep everyone fresh for the playoffs. And it's so different from the Gallant era, which I think sets them ahead. You know, there's still things that they can work and be a little bit more adaptable with. But I think that when you have a cushion like they do, you just want to make yourself better for the playoffs. In Colorado, the year they won, they were so ahead of everybody else that in the regular season, you saw Bednar just start fucking with the lines oh, to go, geez. I, I want to know this is in my back pocket. Well, we'll see. Here they go. The Rangers are in. We'll see if Boston gets in tonight. Teams are going to start to get in as also teams fall out. But we will not talk about them today. Um, we do want to thank, I don't know how much you guys saw, I shared some of it, but we do want to thank everyone who did join in the Spleen discourse. Um, we hope to have <laughs> an MVP joining us. Um, a friend of the pod, Katie Spence, has some intimate knowledge of how the Spleen affects your life. And so we're going to try and get her on to share actual impact of no longer how does this affect the Leafs, but hashtag how does this affect the spleen coming soon to a Too Many Men episode near you. Um, but let's end this episode the way that we are in March, Women's History Month. We're almost out. So this is going to be our last official one. We may have to carry this on if we have other people we want to shout out. But we wanted to recognize amazing women in this hockey space by doing more than just giving them a makeover. I'm not going to comment on that little episode that a certain team did. but Let's talk about some awesome kick-ass women that we know and that deserve a little bit more of the spotlight. Shayna, you are up. Okay. I'm going with someone we talked about earlier. I am shouting out Nadine Musrall, who is a badass coach, um, showing everyone how it's done with Ohio State. I am not going to stop climbing for her to get more opportunities. I want to see more women behind the bench at all levels of play, and we're starting to see it a little bit more. But... You know, I feel like everybody's so willing to dip into the pool at the men's level and go, okay, who's killing it at the NCAA level? Like, expand your minds, friends, because there is someone there who I I want to see her go toe-to-toe -to -toe coaching against John Tortorella. That is personally what I want to see because I feel like they they're have friends. similar strategies and mindset. I, exactly. And they like there's so many similarities that I'm like, I either want to see them work together or against each other. I don't care. I don't care if they have to tear each other down in a game or they're screaming at each other on the bench or if they're working together like to me that could be a powerhouse they are friends and actually i was part of getting them introduced look at that sarah like who's your that makes who's, sense who's your awesome woman oh i've been going women with unconventional career paths in oh. sports lately rosie stop oh my god this annoying dog um i will go katie nolan this time i think it's the path she's created for herself is something I admire and she doesn't have a problem trying new things and then saying no when they don't stick and she's kind of like dips her toes in all these kinds of different things and I just think it's pretty unique and it's one of those things where maybe women think to themselves like that's not possible because like it's just not even something they aspire to because they don't know so she's really done a good job of like paving a way for somebody else to do literally anything like be on jeopardy be on apple tv be on youtube tv be on any podcast i don't know i just i love kind of the commentary space she's in awesome we love both of those women i'm gonna stick it just like you did sarah with my theme which is wonderful people who are part of the Kraken. And this person has a birthday coming up, about to enter her dirty 30s. Sarah, you know her, you love her as well. Oh. Lindsay Brown, who works in the Kraken PR department, is a goddamn force. First of all, she's funny as hell. She is so quick-witted. She is lovely. But what stands out to me and what impresses me is I have watched this human take on new and different significant challenges sometimes not even expecting to have to and just crush it with professionalism with calm with composure with intelligence and i just love seeing her thrive and i truly 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 believe that this is a person destined for 
massively great things. And I couldn't be prouder to know her. Happy birthday, Lindsay. We love you. All right. Love you. We do love you. We'll get two loves, love yous today. Wow. Loves you. Wow. <laughs> like, game well, seven. Loves you. <laughs> All right. Well, that will do it for us this week. We thank you all for joining us on the episode, which you can also find on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash at symbol two underscore much underscore man. That is the same handle that we use for social media where we are on both Instagram and the Twitter. It will always be the Twitter. We love seeing all the shout outs for too many men calls. We love all the spleen discourse. Keep it coming. We see it. We love it. If you want to support Too Many Men outside of the internet, you can buy your own merch. Go to TooManyMenMerch.com. Hats, sweatshirts, t-shirts, beautiful toques, beautiful embroidered toques, beautiful embroidered baseball caps. Mine came in the mail. I love them. You should have them too. Notebooks, anything your heart desires, it's there for you. And until we talk again, we encourage you to do something, no matter how big or small, to make sure that hockey truly is for everyone. We will talk to you soon. Love you. And thank you. Anybody who has sent nice messages my <laughs> way for the mess I get myself into. Thanks for tolerating me and having my back. Seriously. Love you. Bye.